Welcome to lecture 15. Today we'll be covering the principle of virtual work, Timoshenko theory, and we'll continue our coverage of section 8.5 of my book. And so we use uh, the principle of virtual work to derive the 3D theory of elasticity. And the first step there was to use the principle of virtual work where the external virtual work was shown to be equal to the internal virtual work. And using this principle, we're able to demonstrate that using calculus variations, the external virtual work equal to the internal virtual work implies that order Lagrange equations are the equations of equilibrium, which render the system in equilibrium. And so we first chose a body that's deformed and then we applied virtual displacements at every point that we could, and at the locations where the boundary conditions were specified, at those locations, we did not vary the deflections. And so then we calculated the incremental work done or the virtual work done due to these virtual displacements applied at every point of this, bo of this body. And so then the virtual work done is, is in essence, the traction load times the virtual displacement at the location where the tractions are applied, plus the body forces, which could be gravity, for example, times the incremental virtual, or, or sorry, the body forces time, times the virtual displacements, minus the acceleration times the density, which gives you force, times the virtual deflections. And we demonstrated that it has to be equal to the stresses moving through virtual strains. And so now using this formulation, we demonstrated that by using the fundamental lemma of calculus variations, the order of Lagrange equations happens to be bi plus sigma j comma j minus rho ui double dot. And we found that the boundary conditions in a miraculous way gave us a Cauchy's relationship and the deflection specified at boundary V2. Well, at boundary V1, what we have is Cauchy's relationship. We did not use Newton's law here at all. Just using principal virtual work, we're able to demonstrate the equations of equilibrium um, using the calculus of variations. Then I went in and discussed axial bar theory, which are bars that can only take axial compression or tension. And as a consequence, since there's no bending, we came up with a displacement field that is consistent with these assumptions. In other words, if I were to take the derivative of u1 with respect to x2, for example, that's zero because there's no shear in the one two plane. We're not assuming any u2 or u3 out of plane deflections, only axially. And so therefore u2 and u3 are zero. While well, u1 at every point in this cross section moves the same amount as the neutral axis. So it doesn't matter where I am in this cross section, the deflection u1, which is axial, only depends on the x1 direction. So I don't care where I'm in the cross section, every point moves the same as a, a reference point in the cross section. So using that, displacement field assumption, we calculated the strains and the only non-zero strain is epsilon one one. We then invoked the principle of virtual work and expanded all these expressions to demonstrate that the equations of this, the elasticity for a 1D bar is exactly what you learn in mechanics of materials. And then we went on and demonstrated the order Bernoulli beam theory in order of Bernoulli beam theory, we're allowing the, the we're allowing bending now, so the beam can now bend while it can also stretch. The neutral axis could stretch. And so this was what you learn in mechanics of materials. Then I went in and demonstrated what the equations look like for that. But before I did that, I first, I'm sorry about that. We first went through the assumptions and the assumptions is that cross sections do not stretch. We neglect the torsion and warping. 
cross section remains perpendicular to neutral axis during the formation. In other words, if I were to bend this beam, this cross section stays perpendicular to the neutral axis at every point, at, at every point in the deformation. We then went in and uh, demonstrated that the displacement, the displacement assumptions for this theory is that u1 is equal to u, small u1 plus x3 theta, and u1 and theta are only functions of x1. We also show that I'm not interested in out of plane deflections for this theory at the moment. So we made u2 equals zero. And then u3, we're assuming that the beam can bend in the transverse direction. So that is made u3 x1. And because there's no, there's no, the cross section is not deforming relative to the neutral axis. So that angle stays the change, stays the same then we demonstrate that gamma one three is zero, which means that theta can be solved for and then plugged back in here. And so I get U one is this. And, and I demonstrated that if I look at a fiber in the outer fibers, that that will be the flexion U one there because you can see how the point Q moves to the left while the bottom point moves to the right. So it, it just makes sense that you have the actual deflection occurring. So then we went in and calculated non-zero strains and we showed that the only non-zero strain is epsilon one one and epsilon one one is u one prime minus u three double prime x three and then I calculated del epsilon one one and then again invoke the principle of virtual work and the only term that really survives is this one here. And I went on to demonstrate that bi, there's no gravity uh, assumed here, so bi is zero. And then we continue to expand everything very nicely and, and demonstrate that this is n, this is m, because that's clearly bending, this is axial load. And, and then now it makes sense why, why in mechanics of materials, when you did a section cut, then you will draw an axial load and then you will draw a, a moment m. So that, that's where that's coming from. And now I take the internal virtual work, make it equal to external virtual work and expanded the kinetic term and the traction loads applied both at this surface and this surface at the top. And so doing so, I'm able to then come up with an exp expression of external virtual work. And then the internal virtual work is equated to external virtual work. And I'm taking that expression and then integrating of our parts so I can remove all these primes. And once I do that, I can collect terms and I came up with right, we came up with a way of of demonstrating that yeah, so this term here, these terms here came from here, if you recall. And we demonstrated that when you integrate our parts, these are the equilibrium equations, and then these are the boundary conditions. So that's where we landed. I want to point out that this, I want to point out that this term is usually ignored because it's relatively small since it's this time derivative of the slope in the boundary condition term. So that's usually neglected. But you will see that these are the equations you will find. In, in, in the theory of elasticity for beam, this considers the time, the time component of the problem, which is, which is quite, quite uh, interesting. And so then I demonstrated that with order Bernoulli beam theory, we get several boundary conditions, but that the equations at equilibrium are quite contradictory. When I use them, I show that sigma one three does, is a non-zero value while since gamma one three was made equal to zero because the cross section stays perpendicular to neutral axis, then then sigma one three must be equal to zero. So there's a contradiction. And the point is that calculus variations, anytime you make an assumption in a theory like here, anytime you make an assumption, calculus variations will still make the best, uh, will make the best out of the assumptions you made. The assumptions could violate some amount of physics but it will still give you the best approximation. 
And so he came up with this order of Lagrange equations and he came up with the best boundary conditions possible. I want to make sure that when you write essential boundary conditions, you're very careful about writing it in this particular way, very clearly, natural or essential, very clearly specifying what are the boundary conditions of the problem. And so, so then I did, did an analogy. I used the principle of virtual work for 3D. So I showed that how sigma ij is energetically conjugate to epsilon ij. And sigma ij are in the internal forces of the body that react external forces apply to the body in an actual bar theory that internal force is n and units of pounds while in 3d is stress which is units of psi or pounds per in squared and the strain quantities there are that are uh energetic energetically conjugate to n is ea one prime in one the order Bernoulli beam theories n and m and n is energetically conjugate to Ea u1 prime, while m is energetically conjugate to minus Ea u3 double prime, which is the curvature. And that that's where, we're, where we, were, we were having those discussions about, about this theory. I demonstrated, I demonstrated how each of these theories, 3D to 1D, axial bar to 1D order Brunley beam theory, how these theories have a parallel, a story that's in parallel uh, going from 3D to 1D. What is the advantage of using 1D is that it could be very computationally expensive to model trusses with 3D elements or 3D domains, because if you can represent the behavior of, of, of a structure in 1D, that will be computationally less expensive. And there's advantage of using these assumptions in this theory. So in today's lecture, what I want to discuss is a theory, and it's called Timoshenko theory. And then that theory, what we're doing is we're assuming that the cross-section does not to, does not need to remain perpendicular to the neutral axis. It can actually rotate about the neutral axis. So therefore, this theta is no longer zero. And it's sorry, it's, it's here, theta does not have to be the negative of u3 prime because gamma 1, 3 does not have to be zero now. I apologize for that confusion. So in Timoshenko theory, Timoshenko theory works very well for, for short beams, which, re, which will require shear flexibility. This theory accounts for transfer shear deformation. And so basically gamma 1, 3 is non-zero. And this works really well for a one over eight typical length. Any shorter you want to start using 3D elements or 3D domains. And the response is assumed to be independent of the beam section again. The beam section, section is assumed not to warp and the normal is not, does not have to remain normal anymore. And so here I'm using a different convention that I'll be using later. But the important thing I want to mention here is that the, you can see here the cross section there and how that cross-section is no longer perpendicular to the neutral axis. You can see that there, there's a slope, but there's also an angle, an additional angle. That's the point I wanna make with this particular slide. The Moshinko Binti was deliver, developed in 1921. And I'll be going through displacement assumptions later on, but I'm just showing you uh, how, how this theory is, is works. Basically, the cross section can now rotate about a neutral axis. The governing questions I'll be showing later will be three of them because I'll be also considering stretching, but I want to show you in advance what it's going to look like when I work it through. And so, uh, and, and so let, let, let's get started with that derivation now so you can see how that works. So let's get started with the theory. And so I'm going to start um, by writing down the deformation map. So the assumptions are, I apologize for that. So the assumptions are that the cross-section can now rotate about the beam axis. Uh, 
We're going to continue to assume no torsion. We're going to continue to assume no, no warping so that that plane, the cross section will not come out of plane. So it will be no warping, it stays planar. We're going to also assume no out of plane deflections. So not out of the page. And so I'll consider now a, a beam that's fairly short and I'll draw the axis X1 and X3 so it's clear. And then the deflection U1 and U3. And we'll continue with, with the derivation. So the first step, part one, is always to state the assumptions of the theory we're discussing now Timoshenko theory. So this is what this is, Timoshenko. Timoshenko theory, I apologize for that. And so uh, the first part is assumptions. Part two is to really get an understanding of what is the deflections, displacement, displacement theory that's gonna match these assumptions. So what are the displacement theory for Timoshenko for these assumptions to be true? And so here are the assumptions. So U1 is the actual deflection displacement of this beam. And it's gonna be comprised of small u1 x1 plus x3 times theta x1. Now, notice here that we continue to assume in this theory, in Timoshenko theory, that the, that the deflection u1 across the thickness here is going to vary linearly with respect to theta. So that's what we're assuming. You, if I set x3, x3 equals zero, then you're looking at the deflection of the neutral axis. Clearly, the actual deflection of the neutral axis when x3 is zero. But at any other point through a thickness, you start to get an actual deflection that describes, it, it starts to involve bending and the slope. So here, the out of plane deflection U2 is assumed to be zero because we're not gonna look at out of plane. We can add that so that you can learn even more how to do that. U3, X1, X2, and X3. Again, we're gonna assume here that that's solely a function of the out of plane deflection. So again, U3, X1. And so this is a one dimensional theory. So why, why is this a 1D theory? Let's think about that. Is a 1D theory because we're, it is a 1D theory because we're assuming that every, we're assuming it's a one dimensional theory because every unknown here depends on X1. And the unknowns here, what are the unknowns? The unknowns are U1, theta, and U3. As a consequence, I should have three governing equations coming out of here and all depend on X1 alone, the, ac the axis X1. Later on, I'll be showing the theories, uh, other theories that can be used that expand upon this. They will go to two dimensional theories. So let's look at part three. Part three is to calculate the non zero strains. And that, be sh that should be fairly simple here um, because here, for example, epsilon to two, which is a partial of U2 respect to X2, since U2 is zero, that's zero. So that's easy. The part, and for example, epsilon to three should be zero because the partial of U2 respect to X3 is zero, plus the partial of U, three respect to x2 
since this has no x2, then that's zero. And I can continue on. For example, epsilon one, two, epsilon one, two is equal to partial, and I'm forgetting the one half and all this. I'll put twice here, so it's clear twice here. So partial of u2 respect to x1, since u2 is zero, is that's also zero. And partial u1 respect to x2, since u1 does not have x2, then that's also zero. As you can see here now, so far, three strings are zero. Three strings are definitely zero. And then now I'm gonna assume that the cross section does not stretch. Cross section does not stretch. And so as a consequence, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna look at epsilon three three which is the partial of u3 respect to x3, but u3 has no x3, it only depends on x1 again. So that's also equal to zero. And so the only non-zero strains is epsilon one one. I apologize for that. Um, the only ones now are epsilon one one and epsilon one three. So let's, let's continue here. Epsilon one one is a partial of u1 respect to x1 which is really u1 prime plus x3. I apologize for that again. Theta prime. And note that here prime is relative to x1 alone. And then we have eps twice epsilon 1, 3. For the first time now we have twice epsilon 1, 3 and that's going to be non-zero now. So that's the derivative of u1 respect to x3 plus the partial u3 respect to x1. But the partial of u1 respect to x3 is just theta prime. And then this one right here is just u3. Okay, so now that's non-zero and that's, not gonna sh that's going to show up now, which we didn't have before. And, and I do wanna point out that there's an error here because the derivative of u1 respect to x3 is just theta. Well, the derivative of u3 respect to x1 is u3 prime. So I hope you're doing this at home and following along. Because if we don't, then we're going to get lost a little bit. So why we don't now continue looking at the internal virtual work now? So let's look at the internal virtual work. Um, so so this what is the next step? The next step is to invoke part four, invoke the principle. of virtual work, which states that internal virtual work equals the external virtual work. And for that, you know, we have to come up, come up with a problem. So let's assume we have a beam. And this case, in this case, for the first time, I'm going to assume that this is clamped. So I'm going to give it boundary conditions, which I didn't do before. And then I'll have a traction load applied downwards. Which can vary across the top face. I'll call that Q. And I'm going to apply a traction load on this surface again, which I did before. And on this surface, we're going to apply a load P. And for the first time ever, I'm going to apply gravity, a gravity here, G, just for the sake of showing what that will look like. And there's no issue doing it, it should be doable. Uh, I can give you some dimensions here. So the thickness is H, thickness H modulus E. And we could say length is L. Again, it's an example. And so we can do anything we want. This is at x equals zero, say. And this is at L. Okay, so we're giving some dimensions and some values. So we can go ahead and study this problem in more detail. So let, let's look at internal virtual work very carefully. The internal virtual work. And for the sake of this problem, I'm going to uh, neglect 
the the kinetic energy or the virtual kinetic energy, but I'll write it later and I'll I'll discard it as necessary. So internal virtual work is equal to the triple integral over the volume C line J del F line J dV. In our example, sigma j, we only really have two terms here. We have sigma 1, 1, del epsilon 1, 1, plus sigma 1, 3, del epsilon 1, 3. Those are the only terms we really have in this particular problem. And we can quickly substitute what del epsilon 1, 1 is and what del epsilon 1, 3 is. So I'll continue here. That's equal to the triple integral over the volume. And I have sigma 1, 1, del, and now I have del u1 prime plus x3 del theta prime. So that's what I have. So that's fairly straightforward. Plus sigma 1, 3 times now, again, I have a del. Uh, I have... In, in, in here, you're going to find that there's two of these guys. So uh, when you expand this expression, you get two of them. And these two goes here. So therefore, you have you can just plug this directly. So you get del theta plus del u3 prime over the volume. And I'm going to sit, play the same trick I did before where, I not so for example, u1 theta and u3, none of them depend on x, x, x2 and x3. So we can kind of rewrite this in a much compact way. So say I have the integral from 0 to L, but now I'm going to specifically look at the double integral of sigma 1, 1. And I'll put this dA, and I'll put the del u1 prime away because the del u1 prime does not depend on the cross section since u1 only depends on x1. I'll call this n the axial force. That becomes the internal axial force, and we will look at it, that that is the case in a second. And then I have I can continue now uh, with these uh, expressions being derived plus double integral, and now look at how I have this sigma 1 1 x3, right, and dA, and you can see how the del theta prime can be written outside of that dA because it does not depend on the cross-sectional area. Theta prime only depends on x1. We showed that here, right there. These only ones depend on x1. It does not depend on x2 and x3, so therefore we don't have to write that term. And so then I can continue on even further that have plus the double integral and now I have this other expression, sigma 1, 3, which is a new term that we have not seen before, dA. And, and notice how we have this whole thing. This whole thing can come out like that. So this del theta plus del u3 prime. Okay. And so that's, that's what we get. And now we can close the parentheses and call this dx1. And we can now examine each of these terms carefully. And we, we can also now give it a physical interpretation. So these guys here, I'll come, this, this one is moment. And I'll show you, show it in a diagram in a minute so you can see that that's moment. And I did it in the order Bernoulli beam theory, but I'll do it again. And this is shear. Q. Let me show it now. So say this is a beam. And there's a cross section I'm looking at. And let me expand that cross section so you can see what is going on. And say this x1 this way. And then this is x3. And there's x2. And I pardon me for that error not being very straight. So make a better one. And so let's look at that carefully. I can draw a DA here. 
elemental cross-sectional area DA. And if I look at sigma 1, 1 here, sigma 1, 1 is perpendicular, is in the one phase in the one direction. So that will be a vector going, a traction vector going that way of sigma 1, 1. So sigma 1, 1 DA, in reality, if I were to multiply sigma 1, 1 times DA and integrate of this cross-sectional area, I should get a force N. And then if I look at this definition moment, this distance here from here to here is x3 from 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 the plane x to x1 this distance here is x3 isn't that the moment arm x3 times sigma 1 1 that's bending moment also and when it's integrated of the whole area furthermore now that becomes a moment of m and then if I look at sigma one three, that's a one phase. We're looking at the one phase in the three direction. Isn't that a traction vector going that way of sigma one three? Well, if I take sigma one three times dA and integrate over the whole area, it's giving, it's giving me an equivalent shear in that direction of Q. And this one's giving me, a, a, this N is an axial force N, and this M is a bending moment about the x2 axis. So you can see that going on here. I hope that that was clear. And so this this further, this internal virtual work further simplifies then to the integral from zero to L, but now it's simply N, I apologize for that, N, W1 prime plus M, del theta prime plus q del theta plus del u3 prime i apologize for that again d x1 so that's the internal virtual work and now we can look at the external virtual work carefully And the external visual work is the tractions acting on the different surfaces where tractions are applied, of course. I have two tractions applied, so I'll separate them into two integrals. I have a body force this time, which I didn't have before. And it's just to demonstrate how that works. And then on top of that, And that body force has to be acting through the virtual deflections. And on top of that, I have the inertial forces. And in this case, for this example, I'm going to neglect the inertial forces. You can keep them. but they could be considered in a future example. And so let's look at now um, this term. There's a relatively easy term to evaluate. So I do have a G force here, and that's oriented in the three axis, in the three direction, in a negative direction. So the three axes, so I have chosen my axis to go up like that, like that. And this G force is going the opposite direction. So in reality, then I have So in reality, I apologize for that. It jumped there. So triple integral, and then the body force is rho g, and that's acting downwards, del u3, because that's, that's in the u3 direction, 
I don't have the body force in the U1 or U2, so that's zero. And so the only component that I have is really that one. So DV there. And now I want to show you U3 and then DA, this DV can be converted into DA, DX1. These, none of this stuff depends on the cross-sectional area. So then I really have this equal to zero to L, right? And now I only have, so let me write it out. Then I have rho minus rho G A del U3 DX1. That's all I have there for, for that gravity load to be applied. And so let's look at this, this traction load here. I already discussed this in Orden Berluni, but I decided to discuss it today again because it will be very valuable. Now let's look at the first surface here. Let's look at the surface here on the very right. That surface there, that's a traction acting downwards and is acting in the three direction, that traction. So therefore that's double integral of only T3, so del U3, the rest is zero on that particular surface. And I can continue here. So that, that surface, I wanna look at it carefully. That traction load I'm applying is an amount P. And it's constant. Well, this DS here is really DX2, dx3 but p or del u3 do not depend on a cross section at all so then i really get the integral double integral no more double integral because this all can come out like that which is basically a cross-sectional area so i get pa del u3 and that del u3 is really at that boundary of x1 equals l or small l, depending upon what I used. I, I said big L here, but I used small l here. So I apologize for that. You should fix that and be consistent across the board so there's no confusion at all. Okay, so that, that's, that's that traction there, right? So now, now let's look at this traction here. This traction here, here is referring it, it, we're, we're, we're now looking at the top surface where this load Q is being applied. I also made a small mistake because the load P is applied downwards. So the traction vector here again is, is negative here, negative P direction, right? So that should be negative P for this example. And we also have a negative, let me convert this to this T3 del U3, since there's no other traction applied there. That's the only traction being applied at the top surface. And that, that is equal to double integral. And now I applied a load of amount Q downwards. Okay, so that's downwards, Q del U3. And now let me look at this DS carefully. That's a DX1 and DX2 if I look at the differential element of the top surface, it's really dx1, dx2. And this u3, again, does not depend on dx2. So I can be very careful about how I treat that. So what I'll do, I'll take the integral from 0 to L, and again, this negative sign because the Q is going downwards and that traction is going and X3 is pointed upwards. So that's minus Q. I'm sorry about that. Zero to L minus Q. And the Q does not depend on X1 and X2 because it could depend on X1 because it could vary across X1. So that's fine. But you can see how nothing here depends on X2. None of these things are appear to depend on X2. So in reality, what I get is minus Q del U3 
and this integral of dx2 kind of stays there, and I have dx1. And I can now integrate through the width, and I call the width. I haven't even given a, 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 a width dimension, but I can give it here, width equals b in the x2 direction. So this thickness, that width there. And so I'll call that b. So this is 0 to l minus q times b del u3 dx1. And I'll call qb q bar for simplicity. And PA, I'll call it a force applied. And we can give it a name. Let's call it R. So then I have completely calculated the external virtual work. I know the internal virtual work from this page. And so let me write it all down together. So it's, it's very clean. And again, I made a mistake because we're talking about small, big L here, not small L. It's easy to get confused. So it's kind of nice to keep a track of everything. So, so part four continued. So let's look at that carefully. Let's look at the internal virtual work equals external virtual work, which is also internal virtual work minus external virtual work. So I'll bring the right hand side to the left hand side and I'll have this zero to L like that. So all I've done is transcribed all this here, and that should be fairly accurate. And I forgot the del here and the del there. And then these terms, all these terms can be brought to the left hand side. These, all these terms can be brought to the left hand side. So I have a plus there, plus q del u3, and I have a bar there, plus rho g a del u3 and we'll check it later in a second dx1 and then i also have then the the boundary condition which is plus and i call it r del u3 at x equals l and i'm making the left hand side completely clamped in this example this equals to zero and you can see that transcribed everything correctly, it should be all correct, no problem. Okay, so now I'm ready. Like this term, for example, can, can combine, but we'll do it later. Uh, you can see here that we need to integrate our parts certain terms. So there's three things that need to be integrated by parts. is this one here, this one here, and that one there. So why don't we go ahead and do that? So I have part five, integrate our parts and when I do that I have n del u1 prime m del theta prime q del u3 prime and I have m prime del u1 m prime del theta q del u3 and there's a prime here, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. Very good. And so now all I have to do is every term at the bottom goes back into the integral. So then I get zero to L and I should leave more space uh, so that you can follow what we're doing. So I have minus m prime del u1, and it doesn't combine with anything else at the top there. Um, there's no axial load applied, there's nothing else going on there. And so I can continue the derivation that I have plus 
And this del theta comb combines with something else. So I have, again, it's minus, I'm sorry about that, minus, but I can put plus, minus m prime, and that combines with this q here. So plus q, and nothing else has del theta, if we look carefully. Just checking everything carefully to make sure no errors are made. And then I have the cross term over there, which is plus, again, minus Q prime, but this del U3 combines with plus Q bar and combines with plus rho GA at the top. You can see that there very carefully. So, so far so good. Uh, we, we have uh, everything integrated very carefully, dx1. And now we have the boundary terms and we have a bunch of them. So we gotta be careful. We have plus n del u1. And then we have the plus m del theta at both boundaries. And then we have plus q. I apologize for that again, plus Q, sorry, it's a technical difficulty with the board, plus Q, W3, X equals zero, X equals L, and we can't forget this boundary here of plus R, W3, X equals L. Everything equals zero. Now, notice how this W3 and W3 combine at X equals L. So we have to be cognizant of that as we move forward. So we apply by the, fun so part six, by the fundamental lemma of calculus of variations for any del u1, del theta, and del u3, we have three governing equations. We have minus m prime is zero. We have minus m prime plus q is zero. And then we have minus q prime plus q bar plus rho ga equals zero. And this is true between zero and l. And now I have to look at the essential boundary conditions. I said the left-hand side is clamped. So let's look at the boundary conditions. When I look at the boundary conditions, I either have at, let's look at x equals zero, where it was clamped at the end on the left hand side. I have a g dot applied, I have a traction load applied here, which resulted in an R, like a total force R downwards. I also have this traction load applied at the top surface as well, which I called Q bar. So I have several things going on. So the left hand side, let's look at x equals zero. And I want to write all the boundary conditions very carefully. So I have the natural ones and the essential ones. For the natural boundary conditions, I've demonstrated that m prime. So, so I want to look at these boundary conditions here. Again, I apologize for these lines that show up. So n is zero or u1 is specified. Well, at x equals zero, clearly it's clamped, it cannot move. So u1 is zero is a boundary condition. So kind of underline it so it's clear what your boundary conditions are. And the left hand side is clamped. So again, I look at my boundary conditions and I have that. So I have either m is zero or theta is specified. In this case, it's clamped, so there can't be any slope. So I call theta equals zero as a condition of the problem. And at that left-hand side again, I have this idea that I have this Q here. That Q is either zero at the left boundary or 
U3 specified. But it's clamped on the left hand side, so U3 must be zero. Now I look at at X equals L carefully. And again, I have the natural boundary conditions and essential boundary condition. It's the same thing again. N is zero or U1 is specified. Well, in the right hand side, I'm not applying axial load and I'm not specifying deflection. So this has to be the case. In the right hand side, I'm not specifying an angle theta. I'm not clamping it either. So there's no moment applied. You can see here, I'm not applying an axial load or a moment at that free end where X is L. That's not happening. But here, I do have this condition. So I, ha I do have this Q and this R that combine with W3 at X equals L. And so as you can see that as Q plus R is zero or U3 specified. But I'm not specifying the deflection at this point. So therefore, this has to be the truth at the right hand side. And that makes sense that the shear load here is equal to R, which is a shear load. That makes sense that that's, go that's what's going on. So now I have the boundary conditions. I have the equilibrium equations here. And so now I can solve it. Now, to solve it, I want to go ahead and now use the constitutive law. And I want to apply the constitutive law because it's very convenient uh, to write everything in deflection format. So let's start with N. I, cut, I demonstrate that N is the double integral of sigma 1 dA. And I also talked about sigma 1 1 being E epsilon 1 1 dA. But that's also epsilon 1 1 is really U1 prime plus X3 theta prime dA. And so when I continue calculating everything, that's the integral of E U1 prime dA plus double integral of E theta prime X3 dA. Now notice that this does not depend on this dA, which is, this dA is dx2 dx3. U1 only depends on x1. The same thing here, none of this stuff depends on dx2 and dx3. And so therefore, that becomes Ea u1 prime. And the integral of, and I'll show you in a second here. So I have plus E theta prime, double integral x3 dA, this will be zero. Because that's integrating through a thickness. And so I can write it out for you so you can see it. You can do it quick. I have the integral for the x3 direction, okay, which is the height. And then I have the width. So let's do the width first, minus b half to b half. Okay. dx2. And then minus h half to h half x3 dx3. This is zero for our problem. So this is Ea u1 prime. N is equal to Ea u1 prime. And then the moment, I can now do the moment. And sigma 1, 1 against E times epsilon 1, 1. And I already know what epsilon 1, 1 is because I have it above. And I'll multiply with x3 right away. And now, again, by the same argument, I will show you in a second. This does not depend on dx2, dx3. And again, 
the same idea, this is zero, from the same idea from here when we discussed it, um, plus double integral. And note how this does not depend on the cross section again. So that's EA double integral, sorry, not EA, this is theta prime. And how this is this moment of inertia of the cross section. So that's I. We should learn in mechanics materials how to calculate that. So we're slowly making progress on what each of these things are. And we are learning how everything comes together. Now look, let's look at Q, which is a double integral. And that one we define as sigma one three dA, which is twice epsilon one three times G, the modulus. We, we learned that earlier in the constitutive law class. And epsilon one three here is twice and hopefully you recall how to look at that carefully. We learned that's theta plus, sorry, there's no twice there. This twice goes there, but twice epsilon one three was equal to theta, and that was theta plus U three prime, dA, and times G. And note how none of this depends on dx2 and dx3. They only depend on x1. So you just get ga theta plus u3 prime as the main uh, idea here that need to be considered. So all I'm going to do now then is substitute this n, m, and q relationships back into the constitutive law, or in, sorry, into, into the order Lagrange equations. And that way I'm able to get everything together. So final equations for Timoshenko. Beam theory. So I can plug it in now one by one. So I have minus M prime is zero. I'll repeat the equations here. I think it'll be convenient. Sorry about that. Then I'm going back and forth. But I think it's convenient. All this, the, the only here, now, now I can just take that and replace it with the relationships in this page. So I have EA. As the first equation. The second equation, I have minus EI theta prime prime plus Q is zero. And here I have minus G times theta plus U3 prime prime plus Q bar plus rho G A is zero. And these are the governing equations which I can now solve for U and I, I forgot here U1. Okay, hopefully I didn't re forget it here. No, I didn't forget it there, so I'm good. So I want to solve for u1, theta, and u3 using these three equations and the boundary conditions here in this page. And I've underlined the right boundary conditions for this problem because I, I, I made it very specific in this example. So, so this demonstrates how to approach Timoshenko beam theory, and it demonstrates that it, it is possible to derive a theory based on assumptions that one makes uh, in this in, in a particular theory.
I want to correct something that I stated here that's, that's incorrect. And uh, it's, it goes here, it's, this should be GA. So I, I made a mistake there, I want to make sure it's corrected. And that, that is very clear what has been done. So there's no confusion. So again, three equations. A here is a cross-sectional area. I is a moment of inertia of the cross-section, which can be calculated based on what you learn in mechanics and materials. I have some video lectures uh, in YouTube that you can go ahead and check on how to do those calculations. Now, I want to discuss something called the shear correction factor in Tomoshenko beam theory. And it is an important consideration. So earlier, I had defined uh, Q to be the double integral of sigma one three dA. And here, I'm gonna put a factor K in front, which I had not discussed before, but I wanna discuss it now. So if you look at this carefully, what is sigma one three? Sigma one three is equal to twice epsilon one three G. And epsilon one three was calculated and demonstrated to be, sorry, G times theta plus U three prime. But none of this depends on X two or X three, which means that it is constant through the cross section completely constant through the crossing. So I apologize for that, for that movement there. So, but, but if you look at mechanics materials, there is a parabolic distribution when you apply a load through a thickness. So this is saying that if this is X1, and that's x2, and that's x3. Since this not, does not depend, that does not depend on x2 or x3, that sigma 1, 3 is constant through this whole thickness. But in reality, we know from mechanics and materials That, this, that the distribution is actually parabolic through a thickness. So there's an inconsistency in how that works out. And you learn from mechanics and materials that if you were to apply, and in this case, I applied a load, a load R. You saw it here, I applied a load R, R in the end, that then the shear, according to the theory, from mechanics materials is really 3R over 2BH, one minus twice X3 over H squared, and then the maximum value, and then here again, X, we're looking at this here, like that. And so the stress is zero at the ends when a shear load is applied R, and it's a maximum at this point, uh, which will give you, in essence, a value of zero here. And in essence, you get um, this ratio of three R over two BH. And so what people have done over time is to find a way of correcting for that by adding a factor K here. And to accomplish that, one approach is to integrate, to find a strain energy due to the stress and due to the stress, and then equate that to figure out what the factor K could be. So that's what people have done in the past. And it is an interesting approach in, in doing that and, and trying to figure out what can we do to, 
to to correct this this theory because there's a shortcoming in this theory. Again, every time you make an assumption, there'll be an inconsistency that needs to be fixed, and 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 that is not quite apparent. I always how to do that. So to accomplish that, one approach is then to integrate to calculate the strain energy. Use the strain energy for Timoshenko. And when I look at that particular case, strain energy for Timoshenko equals the integral of sigma one three, and I'll put T for Timoshenko divided by two G. Okay, and that's that's the strain energy I'm interested in calculating. This is squared here. Okay. DA. So we want to integrate that through a cross sectional area. And when I do the Timoshenko theory and I were to integrate it, we, we can quickly get to the bottom of it. In Timoshenko theory, since the stress is constant through the thickness, and I'm applying our load R there, then this has to be equal to R divided by BH squared, because it's constant through the thickness, 2G dA. And it should be fairly simple to integrate this through the thickness. And since it's constant, you should be able to get a quick calculation of that for Timoshenko. And then you can use the mechanics of materials approach, which is now integrating this through a thickness. Mechanics of materials squared or 2GDA. And when you that do that, you'll get another number. And so the idea then is to correct this mechanics, this Timoshenko theory uh, by adding the factor K. And what you want to do is basically what factor do you need here to correct it, to correct these two. So you want to take the ratio of these two. And when you do that, you get a value of K of five over six is what people have found to be the shear correction factor for a cross section, no area that looks like a rectangle. And so that is the approach that has been used in the past that has been fairly successful and has worked and, and it is being used quite a bit. So again, now I want to summarize all the theories again so you can see the parallel aspects of all of them. So 3D theory, and sorry about that. I'm going to look at the stress and the strain. And I'm going to start with 3D theory again. 1D axial, 1D Euler Bernoulli, and then 1D Timoshenko. So you can see how we're having these parallels that are going on. For stress, I have sigma ij and the strain is epsilon ij. These are energetically conjugate. The second period of Kirchhoff is conjugate to the Green Lagrange strain. We discussed that. For the 1D axial stress, we have that there's, if you do a cut on a beam or an axial bar, that N is an internal axial force that resists external axial forces. While in 3D theory is a sigma ij acting on a cube, and those stresses are the one that react external loads to the structure. So this is Ea u1 prime. That is a strain that's energetically conjugate with N. And then we have the order Bernoulli beam, which is you have the axial load N and the moment beam M. And these are energetically conjugate to Ea U1 prime minus Ea Ei U3 double prime. And then Timoshenko beam theory, now we have three of them, N, M, and Q. 
And these are energetically conjugate to EAU1 prime, EI theta prime, and then GA, and hopefully we'll, we'll go and check on that, GA theta plus U3 prime. So these are energy, this is how they're energetically conjugate to each other. And if I go to more theories, I'm gonna find similar parallel approaches that, that, that shoot close together, okay? So now that we have derived these theories, um, what I wanna do now is to discuss a little bit uh, how the Timoshenko beam theory can compare uh, for a simple cantilever beam with a load applied P. So no, no traction loads applied uh, on this surface. So there's no traction applied there. You will see these equations closely resemble what I have in the previous page. When you see W, that's U3, for example, in, in our example, we don't have a P load, we don't have a traction load. So it kind of simplifies things. Anytime you see here in these equations, X, that's with really X1. So we can continue on, I wanna show you. So when you compare Timoshenko and order Bernoulli beam theory, uh, and I calculate the deflection of this tip by solving those equations I had before, what I'll find is that I'll get, if I don't have Timoshenko theory, I just look at order Bernoulli beam theory, I'll get this, which you've seen before in mechanics and materials. That law works very well for very long beams. But now if I'm looking at shorter beams, this starts to play an effect. And so you wanna now add this extra term that comes naturally from Timoshenko beam theory. And so if I compare the Timoshenko tip deflection to the order Bernoulli tip deflection, and I take the ratio, I get this. And you need to apply that shear correction factor five over six, of course, that I discussed. And what you can see here is that Timoshenko and order Bernoulli beam theory become one for L over T greater than A. So once you're high enough, the two theories match very well. But when the beams are short, Timoshenko plays an important role and you start have to use a theory, a more advanced theory with a shear correction factor. So that concludes the Timoshenko talk for today. And I will then start moving to new topics, but this is a very important topic that needs to be considered. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.